everyone. <laughs> Thanks for coming tonight. Hi. <laughs> um, so my name is Scott, and um, I've been a trainer for close to 15 years now. And I've been using uh, marker-based training, uh, particularly clicker-based training, um, since pretty much the very beginning. Um, so that's actually uh, the technique that I started using, I think, probably after we had got, first gotten our dog, probably the second year that we had our dog, I started doing clicker training, and I've been doing it ever since. Um, and we do clicker training, and we also do um, something called uh, marker-based training, which is just kind of a general category um, of what clicker is. So I'm going to walk you through a bunch of things today, and it's going to come at you kind of fast and furious, but try to absorb as much as you can. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how dogs' brains work and some of the reasons why we like using a clear signal to let your dog or your cat or whatever animal you're training know what it is that you want them to do. And the reasons are uh, directly linked to the way that they think. So that's one of the reasons why we like using these things. And um, we use this basically to indicate to your animal that you're working with um, what exactly it is you want them to do. Um, when you're using some type of clear and concise short signal to do that, it's called a marker. Um, and when you're specifically using a little box that makes a clicking sound like these things in the, in the picture, it's called clicker training. So clicker is kind of a subcategory of marker-based training. So as I mentioned, kind of a short signal of some kind. If I was using a clicker, it would be the click. Um, if I was using a word, I might use something like the word yep or yes, or I might use a letter like X or C, something that's very quick and concise, and it's not something that I use often in conversation um, that my dog might confuse and hear, but then not get some kind of appropriate reward for. Um, that's something that you want to be thinking about when you're doing this and training it, is you want to have it be something that's very unique and it's not going to be confused with other noises that you might make around your animal. So people oftentimes ask, well, you know, what, what do I use uh, clicker training or what do I use marker-based training for? And the answer really is anything that is a behavior that you want a pet or an animal of some kind to do is uh, something that's a valid use for using a marker. Um, it can be anything um, that your imagination can dream up, essentially. So the big thing is figuring out how exactly to set it up so that your, uh, your dog or your pet can learn what it is that you want them to do in steps that lead them in the direction that you want. But that's where you use the marker to help guide them in that direction by teaching them when they hear that, it means they've moved a step in the correct direction towards the behavior you're looking for. So I'm going to just go through some examples of ways it's used in the world, and I apologize if the overhead lights are blending this out a little bit, but there is a dolphin there, and this person has a whistle in her mouth, and she's teaching the dolphin to do a, uh, a nose-to-hand touch. Um, so that's just one example of what you can do. Um, there are a lot of animals in uh, zoos and aquariums, other places, that need to be taught to be comfortable with certain types of handling. Um, so that they can have blood drawn or they can have activities that keep them healthy done. Um, so an example of that would be uh, having them learn how to brush their teeth so that you can keep their teeth clean. So um, this animal here was trained using a whistle to um, learn how to tolerate someone getting in there and manipulating their mouth and being very tolerant of that and not having to be forced to do that. An example that uh, you might be able to see here is that uh, uh, this is actually some training in one of my classes, a reactive rover open air class, where we go on group walks with dogs. And there's two dogs here who are standing on this barrier overlooking a dog park in Pearl. And uh, each dog is being marked for looking at the dogs that are down in the dog park playing and staying calm while doing that. These dogs normally would be in a situation where uh, they would be barking or lunging but they've gotten to the point now where through marker-based training using the verbal markers, um, they've been taught to learn that when they stay calm, it's a much better proposition. They get rewarded for doing that and when they see other dogs. This is another use. Um, this person is using a clicker to show a cat how to navigate across a, a tight wire. 
So there's really no, no limit on what you can teach them to do. Um, and uh, you know, all of this stuff, once again, is just being done with coercion. It's animals learning gradually through gradual steps that it's a safe thing to do, that they can succeed at it, and that rewards come from doing it. This is an example, another example from our open air class. Um, this is a dog being trained to go underneath a barrier. So for confidence building skills, if you had a dog that was scared about going across a smooth floor, if you had a dog that was frightened about going into a crate, you can imagine, you can apply techniques like this to teach a dog gradually through steps that something like that is safe to do, and encouraging them a little bit at a time using a clicker or a marker of some kind. This is another example. So teaching lizards to come up and uh, greet or do something where they're supposed to be uh, hanging out and using this lettuce here as a reward. Um, I'm not exactly sure what's being done here, Billy. Do you remember what this was? <laughs> <laughs> that were taught to have good manners around food. Good manners, okay. So sit still and don't launch yourself into the food until you're told it's okay. <laughs> don't eat my hand. Don't eat my hand. Eat the lettuce, not my hand. Um, this is another one. It's not limited to just uh, mammals. You can train all sorts of creatures to do things. Um, this fish was taught to go through a hoop inside the tank. And they use something like a pen light or an LED that's mounted on the side of the tank to indicate when they've done something correct. And you can teach them to go through it in gradual stages till eventually they're doing the full trick that you're looking for and going through the hoop repeatedly. And here is one of my favorites. This is my dog, Misha, here. Um, and she actually was trained to do this skill when she was really small using a verbal marker. Well, actually, no, I take it back. I think it was a clicker at that point. And we taught her to do the uh, lie pretty, which is crossing the paws over. So she would always like lie like this. And now here she is at about 14 years of age, and she still offers this behavior to us, something that we trained her to do when she was less than a year old. So um, behaviors like this can stick, they can be really solid and really powerful, and um, you can end up getting them whenever you want to. So I wanted to walk a little bit through how marker signals work and exactly um, what it is that they do and why we want to use them as opposed to other um, methods of training. So a basic foundation of how animals learn is that animals learn by consequences, and um, that's something that's called operant learning. And the marker signal essentially works to um, uh, teach them that when they succeed at doing something, they receive this marker, and the marker indicates that they've done something good, and they get something as a result of that. So that's something that's called a secondary reinforcer sometimes, um, because what you do is you're teaching them that when they receive a particular sound, it means that a primary reinforcer, a treat, will be following after that. And so it serves kind of as a placeholder for the treat until you can get the treat to them. The way you do that is in the very beginning, you teach your animal that when they hear the sound, a treat follows quickly afterwards. And typically, it's within a short period of time after they hear the sound. Um, but it doesn't have to be instantaneously. You can usually have somewhere between two to uh, two to four seconds to deliver the treat at the very outside. But that's a huge amount of time when they may be doing a behavior far away from you and you can walk over to them and give them a treat. That buys you a lot of time from the time they actually perform the behavior. And essentially what it is, is as I said, it's a placeholder for something that's going to be coming to them in just a moment. Now, one thing that you want to be thinking about is um, the reason why we do this is because the reason why we like using markers is that um, animals in general have a very limited ability to make a connection between a uh, behavior that they do, um, like for instance, a dog placing their butt on the floor for a sit, or um, a cat learning that um, when they uh, walk past a window, don't try to claw at the shades. So um, if you don't give them feedback very quickly about that in the form of a reward, then they tend to forget about it and not make the connection between the fact that the good behavior is something that led to a reward afterwards. And typically, you only have 
between basically a half to a second and a half to give them feedback. So one of the reasons why we use the marker is because it allows us to snapshot that moment in time when they do the correct thing and capture it so that you can deliver the treats in a, in a manner afterwards. You can give it to them a short time after that. It buys you extra time to be able to deliver the reward. And something you might want to think about is also, there may be some situations where you can't get the reinforcer, the actual food, to um, your pet in time to be able to uh, achieve the behavior you're looking for. Because um, you may be wanting to try to teach your, teach your animal to do something that is uh, facing away from you, for instance. You're trying to teach a pet to go out and push a, a light switch. Um, and if you were trying to reward them with a treat, you'd have to get that treat right in front of their nose at the instant that they were pushing that light switch to really make them understand that that was a good thing. But with the marker, you can teach them to poke it, get the mark, and then come back to you for the reward. So you don't have to have the treat at that instant when they're doing the behavior. You can get some extra time to get them the reward. So that's why we use markers is it gives you that snapshot of the moment that they've done the correct thing. And um, it's called, um, in training terms, it's something that's called a bridge. And the reason it's a bridge is because it bridges the amount of time between the time that they do the behavior that you like and the time they receive the reward for doing the behavior that you like. Um, now that having been said, you don't have a huge, huge amount of time to be able to deliver the reward. Like I said, you only have somewhere between two to four seconds but in training terms, that's a huge amount of time to be able to get the reward to them after you mark the moment. So things that are happening during training in general that I wanted to kind of walk you through, um, this kind of goes a little bit outside of the scope of what marker-based training is, but I think these are really helpful things to know about, which is that when you're training your dog, you want to try to, um, I'll oftentimes refer, revert to dog, because I know that we're in the dog group here, but there are also people working with cats, birds, other animals, is um, you want to try to avoid introducing distractions into the environment when you're training your animal to do something. So examples of that would be um, doing things like um, using a lure to get them into a set. Now, I'm not saying that that's not a practical technique and that it has value, sometimes in accelerating the process of training, but oftentimes what it does is it builds in a dependency that you need to get rid of later on. And many of you may have experienced this with dogs. If you've trained them to do a sit using a treat, and then you try to take the treat out of the picture and use an empty hand afterwards, oftentimes they won't respond to that because it's become dependence. They become dependent on having that treat present in order to respond. So, if you can find a way to avoid using that lure, at least a treat lure, um, then it's definitely better than having to get rid of it later on. Another thing that you want to think about is when you're in the process of training, you want to try to avoid having those treats hovering in front of your dog or hanging in, out in a place where it's going to keep their attention on the treats rather than on the learning process. So usually when I'm training, I might have a marker like a clicker in my hand or I might just be ready to say a word but I'm going to keep those treats behind my back until the instant after I've made the signal so that it's not something that's coming into the picture or distracting my dog from learning. Um, the other thing that you want to really avoid during training is um, a really big distraction is motion itself. So something that people don't realize is that dogs are actually a lot more visual than they are um, into things that are auditory. So things that are visual in their environment have much more relevance to them than things that are sound-based. So if you're trying to say something like, yep, or clicking at the same time as your hand is moving out, usually that hand in motion is going to be the thing that wins. And so if you're trying to teach your dog to do something and they're waiting for that sound, and then suddenly they see this hand flying out of the corner of their eye, it's going to distract them from that instant when they did the behavior you want. So Having kind of a technique for getting this to be accomplished correctly is really important. Where you wait, you've got your treats out of the picture, you say, yep, or mark with a clicker, and then a moment later, bring the treat out is really important to help your dog not be distracted and learn as effectively as possible. So I'm going to have you guys actually play a game with me so that you can learn about how to use uh, effective treat delivery. So there's some cups here that we're going to pass out. 
And this is something that's called the bean game. So if you guys could all grab a cup and some beans, and we're gonna practice some skills so you guys can get accomplished at how to deliver treats. What's that? No, they're, they're all there, so as long as they're okay. passed. So does everyone have a cup and some beans? Yes, okay. So go ahead and transfer the beans into your empty can. And you're gonna have your empty cup sitting waiting because that's gonna be your dog's mouth. <laughs> okay? So what I want you to do is maybe put the, the cup between your legs or in a chair adjacent to you or something like that and hold it there and have it ready to go. And I'd like you to have one hand that holds the beans and the other hand that's going to be grabbing the bean and delivering it to the cup. All right? So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to keep those beans somewhere hidden out of the way, ready to go. And then you're going to go ahead and you're going to use your marker word, which I like to use the word yep. So I'm going to have you all say yep. And then I want you to go ahead and bring the treats out. Grab your bean and put it in your dog's mouth, your cup. Okay, so go ahead whenever you're ready. Say the word yep. 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 Bring your beans out and deliver it to your cup. And then hide your beans again after delivery. Okay, so once again, go for it. Yep. 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 Perfect. And again. Yep. 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 Okay, I think you've got the idea. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you 10 seconds to deliver as many beans as you can using good technique. So be very conscious about keeping everything hidden. You're going to go, yep, deliver, yep, deliver, yep, deliver, yep, deliver. Remember, reset after each mark. Everybody ready? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, pull your beans out of your cup. Have them ready to go. Okay, empty cup in front of you. All right, on your marks, get set, go. Yep. Okay, so go ahead and check and see how many beans you got in there. Five. 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 How many? Four. Four. How many? Seven. Seven. Okay. Five. Uh huh. Jacking it up there. <laughs> Did you guys have a chance to do it back there? No, no, anyone? Six, excellent. So that's that's pretty good. Everyone was going right between about four to six or so. And if you think about that, that's let's say it's an average of five. So that would be 25 treats a minute, which is actually a really, really high rate of reward. So, you know, using your good technique and taking your time in between, you can deliver treats faster than you're ever gonna have to deliver it to any pack. So that's, I just like people to think about that is really stick with that technique. Follow it really concisely. There's no rush. You can get it out there really fast. All right? So uh, what I'd like to do now is I'd like you to go ahead and practice with your neighbor a little bit. So if you can find a, a partner and one of you is going to be the dog and the other one is going to be the trainer for a moment and then you'll switch. Yep. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> so, talked a little bit about timing, but maybe not completely. Um, so, the way I like to think about the timing is you want to try to indicate to your pet um, the behavior they're doing a little bit before you anticipate it's about to happen. So, if I'm you know, putting my foot down, and you can see my foot is descending towards the floor, what you want to do is you want to try to mark at the instant you see it's almost there, it's bending into that position and it's starting to get there, rather than the moment my foot hits. Because it takes the human brain a little bit of time to process something, and if you try to say it at the instant it happens, you're probably a little too late. And the closer you can get it to the instant it happens, the more precisely your animal is going to learn what it is you want them to do. Right? So, for instance, if you're looking at uh, a high five um, broken down into steps, you see the paw starting to move upwards and it's reaching towards your hand. Then your thumb starts depressing on the clicker, or you start saying the word yeah, right? Or yeah, right? And then as that paw hits, that's when you're going yep. Yeah. Right? So it's happening at that instant. You're starting it as it's starting up. Yeah. So you try to complete it at the same time that act is completed. Another thing that's kind of a secret, um, not really a secret, because we old trainers usually tell everybody if you just ask them, but it, I'm not, I'm not, a thing you want to really be thinking about when you're training is Try not to focus on the entire animal because there's so many moving parts on a given animal. It's so easy to get distracted by all the things that are going on. You know, he's moving his foot, and he's moving his tail, and his ear's coming up, and then he is moving, right? So try to focus just on the body part you're interested in. So, for instance, when I'm looking for a dog to sit, I'm looking just at the base of the tail, right above where it's going to hit the ground, when I'm looking for the precision of that timing. So when I'm seeing that tail, the base of the tail hitting the ground, right, coming right close to the ground, that's when I'm trying to mark. For the nose touch, if I'm, uh, so for the, if a dog is coming to place their nose on my hand, I'm focusing on their head, and particularly probably just the tip of their nose, so I can catch that moment just before they start touching and go, yeah, as they hit. Um, shake. I'm looking at just the paw moving through the air to hit my hand, rather than looking at the whole arm or that entire side of their body. Focus just on the body parts so you can catch that instant when it happens. So we're going to play another game now. And for this one, we're going to pull out that marker word again, the yep, and we're going to practice a couple skills for timing to see if you guys all can get in synchrony and get your timing to be as accurate as possible for something that we're going to be looking for. So, first game is mark the arc. So I'm going to have a ball, and I'm going to toss it up in the air, and I want everybody to try to give me a yep at the instant the ball hits the very peak of the arc in the air. Does that make sense? So it's going to be flying up in the air, it's going to start slowing down, it's going to reach its zenith at that point, that's where I want you to be hitting your yep, and then you can watch it come down. Okay, everybody got it? All right, here we go. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. 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 Excellent. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Good. All right, we're gonna change it out a little bit. I'm gonna do a bounce on the ground. So I'd like you to try to time it at the instant the ball hits the ground, if you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Great. Really, really good timing on this. Yeah, so you guys were almost in perfect synchrony on that. So we're going to just change it out and do a little bit of a different one. This is going to be click the sticks. So I'm going to be moving these around in the air. At the moment when they come into contact with each other, that's the moment when I want you to go ahead and mark. Okay? So we're going to be marking with the yep when they come into contact. Yep. <laughs> Good though, you were thinking like, about marking before it happened, so that was good, I like that, right? 
Anticipating it, but also be kind of seeing, well, okay, is it really coming at that instant? And be ready to catch it at that moment's notice. And sometimes it can be something as precise as that, right? A very particular moment when they're making that decision. And I have to say, I feel a lot for people who have border collies or possums. It's, they have such fast behaviors, and it's so challenging to catch them at the instant. And they're going, oh, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Oh, there it is, and I'm over here. Right? <laughs> Catching them at the instant when they looked at the thing you wanted them to look at or touched the thing you wanted them to touch. And so, you know, you have to sometimes be very expert at the timing on that. So, the other thing I want to talk about is capturing of behaviors. Um, and we talked a little bit about these things, and that actually was kind of an example of capturing. Capturing the moment you saw me touch the sticks together. And... What you're doing is you're waiting for a moment that an animal offers a behavior, and then you're going to be marking and rewarding it when it happens. Um, and it works best for simple behaviors that your animal is most likely to do anyways. Um, for instance, most animals will, most, most dogs <laughs> will automatically sit at some point in their lives. They'll just choose to do it. So there's a good chance at some point you can catch them in the act of sitting. And you can then use that to continue reinforcing that behavior, marking it, yep, when the butt hits the floor, and then delivering a treat, walking off. They say, oh, that was kind of fun. And then five minutes later, they're not thinking. They say, oh, I'm kind of tired. They sit, yep, you're there to moment, at the moment to catch them in the inch, instant of sitting, give them a treat. And before you know it, your dog is starting to learn, oh, OK, sit is something that mom really likes. I think I'll keep doing that. And then, before you know it, you can even start transitioning to putting a word on that. So that before you've done anything, before you've even actually tried to do uh, training with treats using lures or anything like that, you've actually trained your dog to sit and maybe even taught them that there's a word associated with that. So it's a very powerful technique because it removes um, the, the treats as a lure entirely from the picture. Um, and it really helps a dog or an animal to learn um, without you having to interfere in any way or to guide their behavior. They're actually, the way you're guiding it is by using the marker signal. Shaping is something that's similar to that, um, except that it's more of a stepwise approach to getting what you want. Um, there are some behaviors that are more complex where you may need to get your dog to do a couple different things in a row to get the final thing you want. And shaping can be an example. Uh, shaping is basically what, what that's about. And I've got a couple of videos here I was hoping I could pull one up and see if I can get that to work.
So to finish things off for this evening, I'm going to have you play one last game. And um, this is a game that's called The Shaping Game. And this is another one where you get to work with a partner. One of, your, one of the people is going to be a dog and the other one's going to be a trainer. And then you get to trade and the other person gets to do it. So this is where you're going to be using the marker signal. You can all assume that your pet has been, your pet human, has been trained to understand the marker signal. So you're going to be using the word yep with them. And you're going to be shaping them to do a behavior that's on one of these cards. So that your pet will know what the behavior is, but you will not. So I want you to look at your card and then go ahead and hide it. And you'll know in your mind what am I saying here? <laughs> Did I say it the wrong way around? Yeah. The trainer will know. <laughs> it's amazing if the pet knows it at a time. <laughs> Psychic. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. <laughs> so, your, your human will know what the behavior is, but the pet will not. So your only way of communicating what it is that you want your pet to do is to use your marker word to help guide them in the direction you want them to go. Does that make sense? It's, if you think about it, it's a little bit like the, uh, the hot and the cold game you might have played as a child where you're trying to get someone to go towards something or move, you know, do something. So it's the same kind of idea, but you're going to be using your marker word to guide the behavior you're looking for. So um, let's see. Uh, Jenny, would you mind uh, doing something real quick with me? Just so they can kind of see how this works. She wrote them out. She <laughs> So, can you, can you think of a simple behavior that you can guide me to do? As the animal, I'm going to be trying to do different things to elicit some kind of mark of some kind. <laughs> yep. Yep. observations from myself um, with my experience doing it and I'd like you actually also to share a little bit about what it was like to actually what it was like to be the dog in the experience right and yeah right exactly so share with us some of your experiences especially if you were working on a particularly complex behavior for myself I had to figure out how to touch my nose with my thumb so no, nothing else counted. So, right? Huh? Only and only with my left hand. So I had my left thumb. So it was quite a challenge getting getting that down. And there were a lot of you know kind of false leads and places I went. I went down the path. I thought I was supposed to do something with my hand across my shoulder. Right? I thought for a while that I had to touch my face like this with my hand. Um, and uh, it was it was it was confusing at times. Um, something you want to think about as you're doing this is that. If you're not giving, we, something that we were willing to do because we're humans, is we were willing to stick with it, even though we were getting not a lot of reinforcement, right? We were getting a reinforcement. If something isn't working and you're waiting for 20 seconds, 30 seconds to get something to work, then that's okay for us. But for an animal, if they weren't getting feedback in maybe 10 seconds tops, they'd be gone. They'd be walking across the room and, you know, going and seeing if there's something good to sniff somewhere. So, um, 
That's something to bear in mind is that we need to give much more feedback in the process and little steps, break it down into itty bitty pieces. Um, you know, so you can be rewarding your dog frequently. Um, they say that, um, having done research on this, they say that the ideal rate of reinforcement to help an animal progress at the best speed possible is to be able to reward them somewhere between six to 10 seconds at the most. So even less than that is better, but you should be trying to give them some kind of feedback about every six to 10 seconds. So, you know, ideally six to 10 times a minute, right? You should be giving them some kind of, that's good, you're moving in the right direction. Or even just, hey, you're staying with me and you haven't walked across the room. I'm really happy about that, right? <laughs> so, you know, whatever it takes to keep them in the process of learning is really important. All right, well, that's it. Thanks for sticking through it, guys. I really appreciate it.